Are you ready to hear some stories? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We do appreciate your presence this afternoon and to our viewers online. I am Julianne Tabigne, a foreign domestic worker and one of the core team member of Migrant Writers of Singapore, your substitute host for this afternoon, as Elise Morante won't be able to join us today for a health reason. Before I will start, I would like to remind everyone to the con to the consuming, for the consuming food and beverages inside the hall is not allowed. And, be, and for your personal necessities, the restroom is located just outside the exit. Additional to that, you can also purchase books from different selections featuring our writers and presenters into our small book fair just outside the right, right before you enter. Thank you so much. This event is organized by the Migrant Writers of Singapore, supported by the Singlet Station, Chuchi Humanistic Youth Center, One Bag, One Book, and the Majority Trust. Let's begin. Welcome to this segment of This Is Me, Stories of Mental Health. Yep, this is a storytelling hope you enjoy, the meaningful and fruitful stories from different lives. We, from the Migrant Writers of Singapore, we believe that we have story to tell. In this segment, storytellers celebrate the everyday and the commonplace by paying attention to the little things one can reflect to their emotion, well-being, and bringing new perspectives to light. All right, let's stop the waiting. For today's storytellers, we have four storytellers from different countries. We have from India, Bangladesh, Philippines, and Singapore. So let's get rolling. Our first storyteller is a single mother to an eight-year-old from India. She has working in Singapore as a domestic helper since 2016. She is a kind and positive person who always wants to help others. Please welcome Dimple Carr. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> so, my name is Pimple Kaur, and I'm from India. My state is Punjab. So, I'm a Punjabi girl. Uh, I have been working in Singapore as a domestic helper for six years. And in these past six years, I faced a lot of challenges as a helper. And yeah, these challenges teach me so many things. And when I was facing these challenges, I was crying, I was sad, I was thinking why this all things happening to me. But today I'm thankful to all those things that happened to me because of the dead things, what I am today because of dead things. So I'm grateful for that things that happened to me in the past. And today, uh, actually in this last year, I have a lot of stories, I have a lot of to tell. But in today's event, I am just going to share with you a little my first experience. So 23rd August 2016, I woke up in the morning as regular. I kissed my son, who was sleeping beside me. He was two and a half years old that time. I made him awake and I got him ready for school. I went to school to drop him. I kissed him again and I hugged him tightly. I told his teacher, please take care of my son as I'm leaving for Singapore to work. The first time 
I was leaving him alone since he was born. My heart was full of pain. I wanted to cry loudly, but I was hiding my emotions to show to my parents I am a strong girl, even though I was not. I was feeling totally broken. I reached the airport in the afternoon. That was the first day when I saw an airport, when I saw an airplane. I managed to get on board with some of my broken English. So yeah, before that, before arriving to Singapore, I could not speak a one sentence in English. I just speak one, two, three words. And then I try to <laughs> next person understand me. Yeah. So I managed to uh, get on board. My plane landed at night. My employer picked me up from the airport as it was a direct hire. I found an employer myself on the internet who reached home and slept. The next morning, I found out some rules and works they set for me. I was not allowed to sit on a chair or a sofa. I could sit only on the floor because I was a helper. I had to sit on the kitchen floor to eat my food. I, I was not allowed to sit on the table and eat the food because I'm a helper. I was not allowed to eat any fruit at home because helpers don't eat fruits as per their opinion. I was not allowed to eat yogurt or drink milk because they were costly things to give to the helpers. Helpers could eat only lentils and rice. I was not allowed to say no to anything. I was not allowed to share my feelings or emotions. I had to clean three bedroom apartment daily. Every day I needed to scrub the every bathroom floor. Often she asked me to scrub the whole house floor. I needed to clean every window, every door, every piece of furniture, even it's clean, I had to clean it again because they just wanted to saw me I'm working on every moment because they hired me for work, actually for continue work. So they just wanted me to see every moment I'm doing something, I'm working. I reach, sorry, I needed to take care of the kids too. I needed to iron every piece of cloth that they were using, bed sheets, night clothes, day clothes, office clothes, outing clothes, even underwear. <laughs> because they believed when you iron the clothes, the all bacteria would die, <laughs> bad bacteria would die. So this was their thinking. So I was ironing every stuff at the house. I had no rest. I was not allowed to go out. I was not allowed to make friends. I had to sleep on the floor. They were allowed to ask me to do the things anytime. It does not matter it's a day or a night. They were asking me to 11 p.m. make a tea for us. And 2 a.m. in the morning, they were asking me to wake up and clean the our child vomiting. So they considered me as a robot whenever they can press the button to do the work. I was not a human for them. Uh, furthermore, I had to listen to their harsh and rude words every day. They could insult me anytime, anywhere, because I'm a helper. And still, I had to shut my mouth. I had to stay calm. Even inside, I'm burning with their behavior. And the hardest part, still, I was telling to my family, I'm totally fine. My stomach is full of food. I have plenty of rest, and I'm having a good life in this modern country. 
This is the hard truth of every domestic helper's life. Thank you. Thank you, Dimple, for your story. And for our second storyteller, is from Bangladesh. Came to Singapore in 2008. He is currently working as a hydraulic operator. Sumon is an ambassador of Migrant Workers Center, administrator of Human Friend Foundation, and a writer. Please welcome Sumon Biswas. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Shuman Bishash from Bangladesh. I'm migrant worker in Singapore. I Singapore coming 2008, almost 15 years. I also ambassador MWC, and I have foundation, Human Friend Foundation. I here coming, I need to say my story. I 15 years, my story 15 years. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, how do I this one finish? So I, a small story I want to share with you all. This story make me 15 years sad. 2008, when I come to Singapore first, after then, every day, every moment, my mother call me. I only one son, every day call me, what are you doing? Why you go Singapore? I have, lo I have everything, land, property, why you go? Because that time I am very naughty. I cannot study. So I, I want to work in other country. So I come here. Two years, every moment, my mother called me. Then after then, I two years, I call my boss. I want to go home, I see my mother. Then after I go to Bangladesh, my mother very happy. I coming, I coming back. Then I go one month home leave. Twenty days over ready. Suddenly my mother is struck, heart is struck. He so much happy. Also heart is why heart is struck I don't know. Seven day in hospital he admit. Then after the seven day recover ready. My holiday, 29 days ready. Doctor say, you cannot talk anyhow to your mother. I say, my holiday going to finish. I need to go to Singapore. My boss calling me. Day 29, I talk my mother. I go to my city, Dhaka, some paperwork, then after I, co I come back. My mother, Talk to me, I know you lie to me. You, you don't go to Singapore. I say, I no go. Mother, I no go. I working in Bangladesh, I no go. I just lie to her. If I say, I, I go to Singapore, he shock. Again, he stop. Then after then, I come, my city. I, I think, so deeply, why I lie to my mother? But doctors say, my mother don't allow to I come to Singapore. But I, I want working. That's why I come to Singapore. After then, I, night I come, my traveling to eight hours, my city. Then I come to Dhaka. Morning, 4.30, my fly. After I 4.30 go to airport, I thinking, my mother, I calling. See, something can talk. I say, I, I, I come back. Then after then, I go the inside the airport, I feeling something. I feel what, what happening in my life. Something happened. After then I go, I just, I, I just forget everything. I just want to go to Singapore now, okay. Then I go the airplane inside. 
after then sometime we bangla people india people when the airplane inside the airplane inside we talk to family or video call everything want to show i am the airplane like this i also do like this suddenly my brother call me and now you where i say i am in, inside the airplane you see airplane i am the inside airplane then say you you call down fast i need to talk i say after 5 minute this airplane go on the sky network gone ready we cannot call me then say you listen me fast then after then then i happy happy talk with him then say just now your mother is fast away he's gone how i feel this time i i cannot talk with him suddenly my mobile network cut airplane is going to singapore on the sky how i fling this time anybody to know i i i want to cry so loud but i cannot cry i go the inside the airplane toilet i cry there after then four hours traveling i come singapore i call my boss boss like this happened ready my mother passed away ready just now i am to again go home bangladesh the mas my boss is very good person is very humanitarian person and a good heart he come airport i say you call down fast then you no need to go back now you come ready your mother fast away ready then you just quiet you two days no working is after then you be okay then after then i go home take rest i after two days i go working because singapore when i working every eating time makan time lunch time dinner time always my mother call me hey i want to see you eating or no so seven days i cannot eat properly because when i go makan time i want to eating i i miss my mother why today she no call me so almost i seven year after then my mother die i seven years no go back bangladesh because when i feel i no have my mother so i continue working here so everybody try to take care your mother mother is good good lover and important lover our life so that's all my story thank you very much everybody Thank you, Simon, for your stories. Yes, and for our third storyteller, we have a Filipina writer based in Singapore and author of four novels, *Miss Makeover*, *Budget is the New Black*, *Girls Meets World*, and *No Boyfriend Since Birth*, which was adapted into a TV series. A former journalist, she started as a news reporter before becoming a lifestyle editor. for international and local magazines including Cosmopolitan Philippines and Harper's Bazaar Singapore she is a member of the Singapore Writers Group and has led talks and panels at literary events in Southeast Asia she is a co-editor of Get Luckier a collection of Philippines Singapore writings please welcome Claire Betita de Guzman Okay, wow, thank you for the very wonderful introduction and thank you everyone for being here. I'm really happy and honored to be speaking with you today. I'm Claire, I'm a, I'm a novelist and former journalist. I'm also a wife, a mother, and a homemaker. And today, 
my stories about self-compassion and how I found it through writing. My story happened during the pandemic. Pre-COVID, I was, like everyone else, very busy with my life. And perhaps I didn't realize it then, but many things were getting out of hand. I was busy, sure, but I was also doing too much. Traveling too much, spending too much, eating too much, drinking too much. And I didn't give a lot of thought to any of this. I booked flights, I bought things, I ate and drank mindlessly and talked or not talked to people without really thinking deeper and of the consequences. In short, you could say that it was a mindless kind of existence, full of distractions that I've set up for myself. I was working on my novel, but I didn't seem to be producing any pages or writing much despite having some time for myself. I wasn't working a nine-to-five job in an office, so I had flexible hours, good hours. I actually controlled my own time. I should be feeling good, right? Fortunate and privileged to have this time, this space, these resources, a family who supported me. But I didn't. Instead, I felt like a failure. I didn't like myself at all. And we really are our own worst critics because without realizing it, I've developed this bad habit of scolding myself. I regularly told myself I wasn't good enough, I wasn't driven enough, and that I missed opportunities because I was weak, soft, lazy, not up to date, whatever, etc., etc. There are so many. You know how people say you have to love yourself? Sure, sure. I wanted to love myself. But at this time, how? I didn't even know how to be kind to myself, to be compassionate. It's supposed to be basic, but I didn't know how. I appeared okay outwardly. But the truth was, I was disconnected from myself, and even more, from others. I was deeply unhappy. At the height of COVID, I didn't step out of my house for five months. Like most of you, I was scared, and I couldn't do anything. Being a writer, I went back to writing. And I remembered a journal, a blank notebook given to me some years ago, at a week-long writing workshop overseas. It's for morning pages, my tutor said back then. Write, if you can, one to three pages in your journal the first thing you, after you wake up. It's a creative practice introduced by Julia Cameron, the author of The Artist Way. According to her, writing first thing in the morning is cathartic, ritualistic, it clears your mind, builds your confidence, and creates a path for greater creativity. You know, I've been keeping a journal for most of my life, but I only wrote in it at various times of the day when I had free time, when I was in the mood. But I tried this. I did it. For nearly every day since the start of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, I woke up grabbed a pen and my journal, and wrote. Took less than 30 minutes, but it was the first thing that I did, before anything else. I wrote the dreams I had the night before, wrote my worries, my fears, even my grocery list. Anything and everything that crossed my mind, nothing was off limits. And then I found myself writing about things I was grateful for. This daily act of writing, this act of giving myself my first energy of the day, you know, instead of scrolling through my phone, for example, allowed me the time and space to somehow get to know myself, to somehow understand who I really am. I saw myself in these messy, half hazard pages that I wrote. I heard myself, who I was, what I've done, 
what I want, what I've always wanted to do, good and bad. And one thing I really wanted was to learn how to love myself in the real, true sense. What is it really, loving yourself? I learned through my daily practice of writing that it's simply being kind to myself. Writing in my journal has allowed me to tell myself again and again that you are enough. You are doing your best. You made mistakes, yes, but you coped with the way you knew how. Through writing, I learned to forgive myself. Through writing, I found compassion for myself. I have five notebooks filled, but I haven't finished my novel. That is okay. Post-pandemic, life has not really gotten easier, easier for me. You could say that the challenges I encountered after the height of COVID were harder, worse. I lost my mother-in-law to cancer. We had to let go of our house help, and I had health problems. I've had two surgeries this year among several other procedures. But I feel stronger. I feel capable, balanced. I feel genuinely at peace with myself and still sincerely connected with others. And I feel grateful. I believe that mental wellness is not about being happy all the time, but being able to manage yourself in different situations, good or bad. So today, I encourage each one of you to please give yourself a big pat on the back, to please honor your progress. Tell yourself, you got to this stage of your life because of you, and that is no easy feat. Also, please try it. Start your day with writing instead of social media, Facebook, or Instagram, or email. Wake up. Write a page in a blank notebook, and then carry on with your day. It's not a magic formula, writing, but maybe it will get us closer to living our life with compassion, curiosity, gratefulness. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Miss Claire. Yes. Last but not the least, save the best for the last. Our fourth storyteller is 30 years of working in advertising and the hospitality industry in Singapore. Mahita Bas wrote her first book, Praying to the Goddess of Mercy, a memoir of mood swings published in 2012. And she now spends her time on mental health and migrant workers' advocacy while pursuing personal interests, including reading and writing. Her first novel, Rain Tree, was published in 2016 and was selected for the National Arts Council Catalog Fiction Singapore 2017-2018. She has seen written to more books and novel and work of nonfiction. Please welcome Mahita Vast. Claire earlier said that uh, you don't have to be happy all the time in mental wellness. I'm on the opposite side. I'm happy most of the time, but I'm also quite suicidal. So this was my latest book that was launched uh, last year. It's published by Marshall Cavendish, A Good Day to Die Inside a Suicidal Mind. Um, it's done quite well, I suppose, because people are just quite interested in the bizarre. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit from this book. Um, it is an impossible goal for me to remain in a perpetually non-suicidal state. To stay alive, I must then try to minimize any suicidal phases. My past experiences with triggers have taught me what to avoid and consequently what to cherish regardless of how I feel. Avoiding people and situations which cause me anxiety or pain is not something I'm good at often taking action only after a bad experience. 
Creating calming and rewarding experiences for myself is something I learned to do only in the past few years, not too late for you. Some days when I find myself alone in the living room, I listen to music, usually from the 70s, doing nothing else but focusing on the songs. Some days I bake a cake, usually a simple lemon drizzle or orange loaf, which I then slice and freeze. Or I bake shortbread, a jar of which is scoffed within two days. Often, I think of the people, friends, former colleagues, acquaintances, with whom I have shared memorable experiences, some of whom go as far, as, far back as my secondary school days. I have also found contentment and satisfaction as a volunteer with Transient Workers Count 2, also known as TWC2, a non-governmental go government, organization dedicated to promoting equitable treatment of migrant workers in Singapore. Inspired by Debbie Fordyce, the TWC2's president and herself a volunteer, a few volunteers and I gather on the first Monday evening of every month at a room in a small lane off Serangoon Road to issue meal cards to destitute migrant workers who are waiting for outcomes on their injury claims and salary disputes. These men, mostly from Bangladesh and India, are, typical, are typically in distress and usually victims of exploitation by unscrupulous employers and they must fight for what is due to them. TWC2 caseworkers help them with their claims, while volunteers like me do the administration of meal cards to ensure they don't go hungry. Even after almost five years of volunteering with TWC2, I found it difficult to detach myself from the misery forced upon these men. Yet my sadness from them, my sadness for them stops at a point long before it turns into depression for me. Much bigger than the sadness is the emotional reward of speaking to them, seeing them smile and express gratitude either with a nod or a simple thank you when volunteers wish them with all sincerity the very best outcome as we hand over their meal cards. There are still many unknowns, triggers that I, I cannot predict, but I do what I can to help myself. Sleep is critical to my state of mind. I no longer hesitate to take a 25 milligram dosage of seroquetiapin, even if it leaves me feeling dull and listless for part of the next day. My friendships mean the world to me. And where I was once afraid of setting boundaries with certain friends for fear of jeopardizing the friendship, I'm now not, no longer afraid to do so. It is always the little things that set me off, always. Rarely ever the big and the obvious, which is what makes it so hard for people to understand. How can something so inconsequential lead to suicide, or at least even think about it? Especially for someone who seems to have it all. A husband, children, friends who are all kind and loyal, a beautiful home and a very comfortable life. Because that small thing makes itself very, very big in a troubled mind, causing unbearable anguish. And just as it is, it, just as it is the little things that can set me off on a downward spiral, it is equally the little things that can lift my spirits and give me yet another reason to stay alive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mahita, and thank you to all the storytellers for those inspiring and remarkable stories that we can bring along with us. A great stories lesson is a gift that can't be stolen by anyone. Thank you very much. And now for the next session.